Greetings. Friends, welcome to the third part of the innovation series. As you already know, this four part series was originally designed to be presented at a TQIP program at Manet Bhopal. The first part was creativity and innovation. It established the definitions of creativity and innovation and was basically the what, why and who of innovation. Part two presented the hypothesis that the modern resident Indians failure at innovation in the recent past has something to do with our confusing the two related intellectual disciplines of knowledge and dogma. This was how not and what if not of innovation. We now get on to the third part. This will be a more in-depth study of innovation per se and might I add that there will be no definitions in this part and this part alone which I am sure you are sick and tired of from the first two parts. Well, more about the presentation part three in a few moments but before that I want to share with you a correction to part one. I mentioned while narrating one of the slides that I am an atheist. It was for the ease of understanding of those that understand the term that I mentioned it. Technically however I am an evidentialist. This means that I believe only that for which I am given evidence. I have begun to experiment with seeing evidentialism as religion. Why? Because I think human beings need a religion. We are too lazy and too limited in time, resources, sensory apparatus and processing power to think everything through. So we will always want and thereby have shortcuts, always have shortcuts. In my view, therefore, it is better to have a shortcut that misleads us the least. And a religion will always make at least some misleading claims, the worst of which are its incontrovertible, that is undoubtable claims. Because against their misleadership, there is no appeal. No religion or dogma is immune to this problem. For example, Jainism will claim that Anekantavad is incontrovertible. If so, then Ekantavad is false. Further, in that case, Ekantavad becomes an exception to Anekantavad. Thus, despite claiming Anekantavad to be incontrovertible, a believing Jain philosopher will be forced to deny the potential rightness of at least one philosophy, namely Ekantavad. Thus, we see that even Jain philosophy, even at its apex, is not immune to claims or pitfalls of incontrovertibility. So, why not have an incontrovertible claim at the heart of the universal modern religion that is the basis of all knowledge. I feel that the only incontrovertible claim anyone can make is that any knowledge available to us can only be available to us through evidence. Why? 
because evidence is our only interface with reality. Thus, evidence has to be at the apex of the justification of any belief. Therefore, knowledge is the only conceptual awareness of truth that we can have as per my fundamental axioms here identified can only be defined as a belief that can be justified with evidence. Hence, evidentialism as religion. That was the correction or clarification to a statement in part one and now we move on to part three. A disclaimer first. Nobody can really teach anyone anything. The best any speaker can do is to really assist the listeners in thinking. In this part, we shall briefly discuss a few types of innovations, some messages from innovators, and then move on to visions and case study in innovation. Broadly, innovation can be seen as of two types, hard and soft. When we say hard innovation, we typically talk about innovation in products, in your main line of business, basically in your technology. Uh, while the soft innovation is in the other stuff which you kind of adopt from other places and even if you have uh, pioneered it, it's typically not specific to your industry. It's not really about your stuff. So I'm really calling it Tatsam and Tadbhav innovations. Tatsam innovation as it is in your own line, your um, fundamental business, the responsibility of which lies with you. It's typically R&D driven for engineering companies. Research results are usually uh, developed as commercially successful products, though not all research leads to innovation and of course not all innovation in products is based on research. The Tadbhav part of innovations really is new technologies from elsewhere, new processes, new business paradigms, so on and so forth. We'll go deeper in that part of it, the specifics of innovation, but until then a few quotes. We all know Bill Gates, of course. He said, if you don't practice the change management that looks after the future, the future will not look after you. A good insight. He goes on to say, the tendency for successful companies to fail to innovate is just that, a tendency. If you're too focused on your current business, it's hard to look ahead. But it's not as if innovators uh, always innovate or never make mistakes. Oftentimes they are blind, like the rest of us, to upcoming opportunities. Bill Gates, as late as 1993, said, the internet, we are not interested in it. That thinking impacted Microsoft a lot. Thomas Watson, chairman of IBM in 1943 said, I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. Well, I mean, computers used to be really big then, really costly, but then, as we know, things have changed. Um, Lord Kelvin in 1895 said, heavier than air flying machines are impossible. He was a president of Royal Society and thereby an acknowledged intellectual and scientific heavyweight. 
Warner Brothers H. M. Warner in 1927 said, Who the hell wants to hear actors talk? Really? <laughs> I mean, we used to call the movie halls as talkies, you know, but this was before talkies were only movies. Well, other funny uh, quotes are popular mechanics. Uh, forecasted uh, the relentless march of science in 1949 by saying that computers in the future may weigh no more than 1.5 tons. Well, they were right, of course, but now we kind of find 1.5 kg weighed in a computer a bit too much, right? Well, like I said, things have changed. Another quote is, everything that can be invented has been invented. Wow. <laughs> Moving on. Steve Jobs, the man behind and in front of and above and below and everywhere where Apple is, has his 12 rules of success, one of which is innovate. The greatest discovery of our generation is that human beings can alter their lives by altering their attitudes of mind. As you think, so shall you be. How true. And this is precisely what we are trying to do through this innovation series. We are only helping loosen a few locked windows of your mind if we can open them or even if we can just loosen them a little which can be opened later on I think this series would have done its job Stephen Jobs again here's to the crazy ones the misfits the rebels the troublemakers the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They are not fond of rules. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. But the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward and while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius because the ones who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones who do precisely so well I'm crazy <laughs> I'm not saying you become completely cuckoo like me but yeah a little bit uh, of craziness uh, can definitely not hurt George Bernard Shaw The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. A few more quotes in the next few slides. I would like to read them out even though I'm pretty certain you can too. Nearly 100% of innovation, from business to politics, is inspired not by market analysis but by people who are supremely pissed off by the way things are. An idea that is not dangerous is unworthy of being called an idea at all. I like nonsense. It wakes up the brain cells. If at first the idea is not absurd, then there is no hope for it. All great discoveries are made by mistake. I can't understand why people are frightened of new ideas. I am frightened of old ones. If facts conflict with a theory either the theory 
must be changed or the facts and of course I'm sure Spinoza hopes that we know that facts cannot be changed the human mind treats a new idea the same way the body treats a strange protein it rejects it we all agree our theory is crazy but is it crazy enough said Niels Bohr we all know that quantum mechanics is the craziness that has gone mainstream if you're not failing every now and again it's a sign you're not doing anything very innovative the way to succeed is to double your failure rate this is Thomas J Watson remember the IBM chairman who said like five computers at most can be sold consistency is the last refuge of the unimaginative don't worry about people stealing your ideas if your ideas are any good you'll have to ram them down people's throats I love this quote I really love it I'll read it again don't worry about the people stealing your ideas if your ideas are any good you'll have to ram them down people's throats finally Oscar Wilde everything popular is wrong this is a slide I've taken from Vadim Kotelnikov I have borrowed extensively from him for this series uh, I also have acknowledged that in the credits later you may just want to pause this video and read this list though I would recommend that you go to his site and you know take a few courses or something really good stuff there apologies for coming back to Steve Jobs every second slide but then that guy is was great I would say he continues to be great his innovativeness is still palpably present he said you've got to find what you love if you haven't found it yet keep looking don't settle as with all matters of the heart you'll know when you find it thanks Steve for this well a little bit about my theory of innovation what is creativity what is innovation what is it all about well I believe it's only about love if you love three spaces innovation will automatically happen which are these three love yourself love your customer love your work self customer and work now I cannot prescribe the method to you which will allow you to do each of these things all I can do is share with you what I do for myself in each of these spaces I hope that will be useful well how do I love myself by knowing by realizing that I have no option that life is no dress rehearsal you kind of cannot screw up and come back to it in a second life yes there are people who believe that there is life after death uh, I have never seen any evidence of that so I'd like to work on the premise that this is the final take this is the final performance this is my swan song this 
is the only life that can that that I have any opportunity to do anything in so I must move my butt then I keep myself away from what I think is wrong and my beliefs about right and wrong are very different from the mainstream for me what's wrong is that which hurts others that which hurts others that's about it I really don't have all those other grand notions of you know what are the 356 things which are wrong and this is the way to do things and so on and so forth I don't believe in all that so long as I'm not hurting anyone I don't think that per se that thing is wrong uh, next thing is knowing that what I cannot keep away from if it hurts no one and that's a big if cannot be wrong so for example if I'm in love with somebody and it's not hurting anyone else I don't see anything wrong with that love but at the same time if something is hurting somebody else then I think it's wrong so for example I consider jihad wrong because it's hurting somebody that's it I mean when I say jihad I mean in the in the in the commonly understood meaning of the word then how do I love myself I enjoy life I try to enjoy life and finally being of use to others leading me to feel good about myself well that is my formula I would suggest that you discover your own formula it's not about invention it's not about following somebody else it's not about a dogma it's really about your own discovery of yourself of course you have to have some kind of um, what shall I say some kind of a peg to hold you to the ground but that's up to you to decide what that is how do I love my customer well um, uh, by the way what do I mean by customer well customer typically means someone who's giving you money really who's allowing you to serve him who is buying some products or services from you but then customer means anyone for example you are my customer at this moment because you are giving me your time therefore you are my customer so how do I love my customer seeing him and when I say him I really mean him and her as well as it seeing him as my boss my annadata one who feeds me essentially therefore I must truly care about him as also all others that I work with I see them as my customers as well because they are giving me their time therefore they are my customers too and a word about truly caring about people is linked to the next point which is never deceiving him well when I say truly caring and never deceiving I mean that I believe that I am truly caring I believe that I am never deceiving now in that if at some point I am deceiving myself to believe something other than what reality is then you know it's different however I try my damnedest to stick to evidence I believe evidence will tell me whether I am deceiving myself or not doing my best to get him benefits such as increasing his profits decreasing his costs or getting his customers to love him this is pretty important point as far as you know my own thoughts about any kind of service is concerned you should not only be bothered about 
your customer but you should actually be bothered about your customers customers you will truly delight your customer only when your customers customer is delighted with your customer you will have truly loved your customer only when your customers customer gets a sense that your customer is loving him i hope i'm making sense finally when he speaks none exist and that's also true for all others that i interact with that i work with that i communicate with hote ho jab tum goya koi dusra nahi hota when i was making the presentation at manet somebody asked me to, to you know recite some of my poetry in the first part so when i was presenting the second part i included this very fresh couplet um i'm not going to explain it to you it's there on this slide if you care about it please to stop uh, pause the presentation and read it thanks how do i love my work first of all by becoming financially free what do i mean by that what i mean by that is Uh, that it is very important for me to not have to spend all my day working at some job in order to feed myself uh, i was working towards that uh, goal from the year 2000 i was lucky enough to be able to arrive at a good enough um, you know nest egg to be able to take retirement at the age of 43 in 2006 all that thanks to the uh, you know money printing by federal reserve bank uh, which resulted in huge amount of monetary infusion all over the world which ultimately because of the government's policies found its way in india and you know my investments really uh, you know for no credit of mine did well and i was able to uh, take retirement i was able to become financially free so that's the most important point if i were not financially free i would still be forced to work at things i didn't quite love but now because i am financially free i am able to do only that work which i love well if you're not that lucky as i am a you can try becoming financially free everyone can become financially free all you need to do is plan and execute it takes different um, you know durations depending upon how good your planning is how lucky you have been and so on and so forth but everyone can be financially free so that's one thing the second way is that you could actually migrate within your work to areas that you love or finally you can perhaps try making your self uh more loving towards the work that you actually have at the very least it keeps your kitchen fires burning so you should be loving it anyway only one more comment in fact a recommendation on financial freedom i started off on that path by when i read robert kiyosaki's rich dad poor dad so if you want to read only one book uh from now on for the rest of your life uh, that might be it you know from a professional angle uh, from a financial angle from your own household management angle from your personal finances management angle i 
recommend it please do read it well other than becoming financially free uh, how do I love my work doing what I love loving what I do doing what I enjoy enjoying what I do and then two more points doing what I do to the best of my ability and of being used to others leading me to feel good about my work now just a small note these three slides about my three loves I kind of made them in a bit of a hurry I'm sure I could come up with some other points but then the important thing here is that I was just sharing my own discovery about myself with you so it's quite irrelevant what are my points what is important what is relevant is that you should know thyself you should be working towards discovering your own self and trust me on one thing if you don't trust me on anything else on this one thing please do trust me you don't know yourself no one does I don't for all of us it's just a voyage it's just a grand fun voyage of discovery you must keep learning more and more about what you are the more that you know yourself the more you'll know the world around yourself the happier you'll be the happier you'll make people around you you will be at peace peace which is what I am really peddling in everything that I do peace is what I am peddling through this innovation series therefore know thyself love thyself peace will come to you and to your world moving on right getting on to the case study but before that a mini case study that uh, of an area Silicon Valley now what's so special about Silicon Valley well for one a lot of the leading IT companies have found their feet there in fact found their wings there as well so what's so special about Silicon Valley well for one it's synonymous with innovation all growth there is driven by innovation the valley has a knowledge economy and knowledge work is the foundation of innovation or I'd rather say innovation is the foundation of knowledge work highly competitive highly innovative the people there of course not only work hard but have a lot of fun too however the most important differentiator that Silicon Valley has with respect to uh, well Indian industry I could say or Indian society um, I, I, I dare say is that failure is understood to be a primary vehicle for success in other words failures mistakes are seen as your primary teachers as your fundamental friends these are those that actually take you places unless you fail you do not lay the foundations of success later on now this is so ingrained so important that this culture is exported out of Silicon Valley Silicon Valley elsewhere case in point when I was working with Compaq and subsequently with Hewlett Packard 
we were always told make a mistake no problem but learn from it a mistake is bad only if it's repeated multiple times otherwise it's good it's really good i used to tell my team make a new mistake every time you know they actually kind of took it as a quote and they subsequently started telling their teams make a new mistake every time now what's the whole idea the whole idea is that once you make a mistake you learn from it you move on to the next level and you make a new mistake learn from that move on to a still higher level and that way you go on this is one of the most important lessons that silicon valley has taught the world we indian professionals or we of the indian industry or indeed of all of indian or or even south asian society we need to learn this extremely important lesson uh, you know you can even verify it statistically the problem is that we are generally hung up about being right all the time in fact we punish our underlings um our uh, reportees our children our students for making a mistake why why do we do that unless they make a mistake how will they learn how will they move ahead no but we penalize mistakes as a result we have developed a culture where people hide their mistakes where people do not own up to their mistakes what happens we don't learn from those because all the time we are busy hiding them we are we are busy disowning them and when we do that there is no opportunity of learning there because you learn only when you hit yourself at the back of your head with a with a worn out chappal and tell yourself man i made a mistake how do i make sure that i don't do it again and you see irrespective of whose mistake it also is it is definitely a part of the mistake is definitely yours you see taali ek haath se to nahi bachti na taali ke liye do hi haath chahiye hote hain if suppose the other party uh, is is to blame for 99% of the mistake you still are to blame for the remaining 1% of the mistake and maybe if you learn how not to make that 1% of the mistake next time the other hand will not be there to clap so despite the other person being 99% wrong the mistake will not happen so somehow this doesn't get into our heads see i said we can prove that st this statistically how do we do that you see i Uh, as an indian as uh, as a muslim as as a uh, as an as an ashraf as a sh as a as a high class high caste person don't like to own up to my mistakes so why don't i do that because i'm trying to prove that i'm right all the time because being right is valued a lot so all right if i'm going to be right all the time then how much am i going to play You see I'll play only those games only those matches I'll take a risk only those situations which I can almost always win So I will say well in this instance I stand almost 100% chance of winning let me play So what will happen I'll maybe play 10 matches 10 rounds I'll take maybe 10 risks in 10 situations in all my life i would have taken a risk and gone out on a limb uh, when i was certain that i would be able to win it 100% certain but again 100% certainty is never there so maybe my record is like 90% so i get 9 out of 10 oh wonderful 
I've won nine out of 10. I've had 90% success rate. The fact of the matter is I have only nine successes under my belt. Now suppose there's another guy who's not afraid of making a mistake. He is willing to play even at 40% uh, possibility of winning. So what happens? He plays a game and in the first 10 he wins in only four. But then he has finished playing those 10 early. He has learned from those 10 and he moves on to the next 10. Maybe again he wins only four. But by the third time he will probably reach a stage where he's winning five. Even if he is winning lesser, still, if he plays 100 games, 100 matches, 100 situations, he, he, he risks himself and uh, his, his, um, you know, his great name, his great fame. And out of those 25 events, uh, out of those 100, he wins 25 times. You see, he still has 25 successes under his belt. I have only nine. So who is better? Who is more successful? The person with nine successes or the person with 25 successes? Yes, my, my success rate is higher, but who cares? If I give you an opportunity of winning a lottery uh, worth nine lakhs or another worth 25 lakhs, which lottery will you take? I think the answer is obvious to all of us. Before I move on, just a small clarification. When I said 9 lakhs versus 25 lakhs, what I meant was really guaranteed lottery. Something which you're bound to win, right? A bit like a grant. So that was that. Another mistake which I made earlier was that uh, when I was talking about, uh, you know, 99% and 1%, if you believe that the other party uh, must uh, accept 99% of the blame and you uh, are only 1% to be blamed, well, what I said was that, uh, you know, for clapping you need two hands and if the other hand is not there, there will be no clapping. What I meant was that if you correct your 1% mistake, your hand will not be there. So how will the other person, you know, clap? How will he manage to clap? Your hand is not there. So A, you are ensuring by correcting, by accepting that one person mistake, by correcting that one person mistake, A, you're ensuring that the mistake doesn't happen next time around. And B, you're ensuring that you move to a different level. And over a period of time, you've moved so much above the level of that guy who you believe is making 99% mistakes that you don't actually have to interact with that person at all. So you must learn to accept mistakes if you want to be successful. You must learn to embrace your mistakes. You must learn to love your mistakes. You must learn to make love to your mistakes. That's the way, that's the only way to move forward. That's the only way to succeed. That's the only way to learn. That's the only way to not make mistakes again. How? by accepting that you made a mistake, therefore learning from it and therefore moving on. Now there is a question which then arises, why do we find it so difficult to accept mistakes? We as in Indians, we as in South Asians, whatever, we have a serious problem with accepting mistakes. Why? I submit that this is because we confuse subjective truth with absolute truth. What exactly I mean by these two terms? Well, please go to my uh, my YouTube channel and you'll find there a video titled three levels of truth you please listen to that you'll know what exactly I mean 
but to give you a concrete example what happens is that in our society we have some very strong peddlers of dogma now these people believe that their dogma in other words their subjective truth is the absolute truth in other words the real reality now why is that a problem it is a problem because these guys they must not make any mistakes because whatever they have learned by the road you know be it a Muslim alim who has learned the Quran by road or be it a Hindu Brahmin who has learned uh, one of the Vedas by road or indeed it is a Hindutva ec acolyte who believes that Indianness is just such 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 that India is a hermetically sealed container you know uh, no nothing can come inside it nothing can go outside of it and therefore uh, any such thing as Valentine's Day is an evil thing while of course they'll happily use internet and loudspeakers and guns and um, uh, cars and airplanes and uh, what have you loudspeakers they will happily accept that but whatever they don't want to accept that's when those the borders of India become hermetically sealed and nothing can come inside so all these peddlers of dogma they hold a great sway over all our mindsets we believe that they are bringing to us absolute truth so there can't be any mistake in what they're saying therein lies the rub you know they cannot make a mistake in what they are reciting because by that perfection alone they get their power over us therefore this whole culture of penalizing mistakes and we are made to feel ashamed for making all these kind of ridiculous mistakes you know when I'm when I'm uh, reciting Quran by rote I can't I be allowed to make even the simplest of mistakes because then I am actually disturbing the perfection that is Quran the same is true of uh, the power you know how uh, Brahmins uh, consolidate their power over us over the Hindu polity to be specific now what is their power a their ability to penalize mistakes and how do they do it through the shame culture the Western culture and specifically uh, the Silicon Valley culture really is not based on shame it may have some elements of guilt there which is uh, an important aspect of their Christian heritage but shame is very Eastern uh, unfortunately uh, Muslims in India they suffer from both those problems uh, the Abrahamic uh, her heritage as well as the shame culture that we have uh, here in our land anyway what's important here is that dogma depends upon perfect recitation therefore you cannot make a mistake therefore mistakes must be penalized because if you accept a mistake then you will go do something better than that you know you will correct that mistake and then eventually you might even start questioning scriptures and might even start suggesting better methods better ways of living a life and what is gonna happen after that all these peddlers of dogma they're gonna lose their livelihood so that's the reason why we don't innovate that's the reason why we don't accept our mistakes and that's why we don't progress or succeed as much as we should beware of dogma so now case study 
Innovation at Tata Motors. Innovation is in Tata's blood actually and it's a legacy which Tata Motors uh, have received in a good measure. We will be studying three major areas in detail. Innovations in products, innovations in processes and innovations in and for people. 407 platform was the first of the really innovative stuff that uh, Tata's uh, came up, Tata Motors came up with in recent times. In 1980s, they came up with it when uh, Japanese LCV players were really ruling the roost. 407 was designed to suit Indian conditions and along with the traction that Tata Motors had with the truck owners then they were and and of course the brand uh, recall brand value that they had they were able to really control the market very fast and they continue to control two-thirds of the market even in the third decade that says a lot about this particular innovation indica was the product which they came up with in the late 90s more car per car was the slogan that was associated with this car. A huge success, especially once the second version of it came along. This was the first indigenously designed passenger car in India. More value for money in terms of internal space as well as it had some very contemporary f features. And of course, we Indians, we always want competitive pricing. Tata's knows that and it gives us that. So another one of very good, very innovative products from Tata Motors. The third innovative product that I'd like to talk about is the Ace and of course um, it's passenger version Magic which you find ubiquitous in Bhopal today, especially in the old city. So ACE is really uh, designed as the last mile distribution vehicle. Four wheeler functionality at a three wheeler price. Prior to this product, it used to be the larger uh, three wheelers which used to rule this market. And they were and are not very good in terms of uh, fuel economy and stability and everything. ACE is really really innovative really much better product than any of the three wheelers that you find on the market this has an innovative two cylinder indica engine the body is semi monocoque which allows it to withstand abuse rigid front axle and rear wheel drive allows you to run this at a low cost and manufacture it at a low cost as well flat face versus semi forward face to enhance the loading space really innovative product really nice product the fourth product fourth innovative product of course nano people's car or rupees one lakh car uh, of course this product uh, did not quite or at least has not so far lived up to the expectations that we had of it however it still is and was a very innovative very good product the target price itself was a source of innovation. It uh, was so innovative that a series of innovative ideas which uh, led to 37 patents being filed by the company. Engine on the rear side, two cylinder engine, conventionally there are three to four cylinder engines. Identical handles and mechanisms for uh, left and right side doors for reducing cost and so on and so forth. Uh, the interiors were maxed by pushing wheels to the corners and putting the powertrain below the rear seat. It's a contemporary product. Sufficient space inside to accommodate four persons comfortably. Very highly fuel efficient. Exceeds current safety requirements and complies with the current emission requirements. Very good, very innovative product. On the processes front, Tata has got a model which it calls Tata Business Excellence Model. That's a balanced scorecard for uh, 
um, you know, for rating the performance of personnel, it could actually be put in the people as well. But since basically it's a process for the people, I've put it in processes. The use of IT systems throughout the value chain, they use the best in class for each of those. Supply side, they use Ariba. For design, they use advanced CAD and PLM. ERP, of course, SAP. And on the demand side, they have uh, CRM with Siebel. Really considered one of uh, the best deployments of IT in any in industry. As far as product development is concerned, they have institutionalized the stage gate process, which uh, though I don't know much about this subject, I understand it's one of the best uh, available. An important aspect is, uh, of, of on this front is their uh, collaborative product development philosophy. Thereby, they utilize the capabilities of their suppliers, design houses, subsidiaries, and associate companies in addition to their own uh, uh, workforce. Uh, what happens is that uh, a lot of innovative ideas come from the creativity of these uh, specialty houses. So that's uh, really a good innovative model to follow. Continuing with the innovation processes or innovation on the processes front, you find that uh, Tata Motors has followed an internalization philosophy. So they've made global acquisitions like uh, Tata Devu, Commercial Vehicles Company, JLR, uh, Jaguar Land Rover, Hispano, and so on and so forth. Now, I personally had serious doubts about Tata's ability to make a success of these. I mean, we have a different culture and specifically say, for example, JLR. That's a very different culture that has very, very different culture. The kind of products are very different. However, this philosophy has served them well. And they've kind of, as far as it looks now from the outside, they've made a success of those acquisitions. They followed an innovative approach to be seen as a local company in the country of operation. So as a South Korean player in South Korea, as a Spanish player in Spain and so forth. This has helped Tata Motors to appreciate the need and importance of all stakeholders. And this is achieved in four stages. Initiating by understanding the language and the basic facts of the country, familiarization with their culture, harmonization with the stakeholders, and finally synergizing by sharing the best practices and work ethics. Processes, great success of innovation, in the internalization philosophy. Innovation on the people front, they identify leaders through assessment centers. It, they identify young managers with very high potential and the process was actually started by the legendary JRD himself. This has created a pool of very strong and effective leaders. Tata Administrative Services at one time was seen as an option to the IAS by IIT engineers. I mean, that's uh, that's hell of a lot to say about the success of uh, of any people centered policy by any corporate most others would just throw money and expect that uh, you know people would join them but then that means that people are there only so long as they are not offered better salaries elsewhere but tas was a kind of a career building option which people had and kind of still have uh, putting people into challenging assignments or international exposure such as the ace and the nano uh, projects uh, they uh, break functional silos by shifting from a hierarchical organization to one with a more cross-functional team approach now uh, hierarchy is in the blood <laughs> of us Indians but uh, they've really broken from it and uh, the success is for everyone to see that even though they've been losing market share of late but i'm sure that if they come up with uh, a few more innovations if they get their act right and some of the products some of the marketing they'll be able to do well i'm sure now other areas of innovation there are four other areas which we'll uh, quickly touch upon. Purpose. 
concept emanation is an important source of innovation so case in point is tata nano ratan tata saw a family of four riding on a scooter on a rainy day he felt that uh, there was an unfulfilled need of safe affordable and all weather alternative that led to nano price pricing nano at rupees 1 lakh to create uh, disruption in the market was very successful the pricing fell midway between a scooter and the cheapest car the product design was uh, choked for options because of the price target that obviously led to innovation uh, you know necessity is the mother of invention setting the price uh, target triggered a series of innovations as i mentioned so the target cost approach was very important suppliers were also challenged with a stringent cost target given to them but they accepted the same and delivered the results promotion of nano was primarily through portal which got uh, as high as 30 million hits even before the launch of the car and after the launch in the first month there were another 30 million hits that Uh, helped the customers in becoming more aware of the product features and Tata Motors received around 200,000 initial bookings that's a hell of a lot in terms of place or reach uh, the sale of the form for booking was facilitated through several banks new insurance schemes were co-designed with the insurance companies and finally enhanced sales and service network for better reach and service to the customers were designed so even though uh, a lot of these um, you know last four points were focused on nano tata motors have really done those kind of things for other products as well you can get into the management philosophy of tata motors and get to know more about it but let's get to the summary of the case study now so in summary tata motors path breaking ideas conceived and implemented in one or more of the seven p's lead to innovation in purpose product price place promotion people process kudos to tata motors and wish them all the success but they'll come only if they keep innovating remember they'll not get it by dogmatic approach that we belong to the family of jrd and ratan tata or we have done such great things so we will continue to do that or pick up an old book how the earliest products were designed and go by that no they'll have to innovate they'll think out of the box and then they will innovate then they will succeed wishing them all the best i end the discussion on this case study now with this we come to almost the end of our slides and just a few recap slides steven jobs said you've got to find what you love if you haven't found it yet keep looking don't settle as with all matters of heart you'll know when you find it just a recap of my philosophy of creativity and innovation my definition or understanding of it it's all about love so innovation will automatically happen when you love yourself when you love your customer and when you love your work just one slide each with a few quotations and we look at each of these ellipses before we get into the end discussion the first ellipse love yourself a couple of quotes from george bernard shaw if you can't get rid of the skeleton in your closet you'd best teach it to dance very very good quote this one you see you can only fight that much you can only hide that much you can only lie that much it's best to accept the truth whatever it is and 
dance with it. He goes on to say, all great truths begin as blasphemies. Don't be afraid of rocking the status quo. Just don't do it too hard and too fast and too recklessly or destructively but constructively evolutionarily you must challenge all hearsay you must challenge all status quo you'll be called a blasphemer but that's the only way to get to success that's the only way to innovate that's the only way to love yourself love your customer Mahatma Gandhi said a customer is the most important visitor on our premises he is not dependent on us we are dependent on him he is not an interruption in our work he is the purpose of it he is not an outsider in our business he is part of it we are not doing him a favor by serving him he is doing us a favor by giving us an opportunity to do so for the third ellipse love your work mother Teresa said work without love is slavery and there in the pics you have examples of slavery past and slavery present just a summary of what we did in part 3 we discussed a couple of types of innovations very briefly went on to some messages from innovators went on to the question about how to create and innovate we came to some visions of innovation some realities of innovation a mini case study of innovation where again we discussed what could be the problem with us why we do not innovate as much as we should as much as we can as much as we have historically done finally a case study in innovation that of Tata Motors Thank you for sitting through till the end of part three of the innovation series. In this, I've, as usual, made a few mistakes. Some of them I've corrected there itself. Some of them I'll correct later. But one point which I recall just now is that um, I mentioned about the Fed's infusion of money. Well. I said it found, uh, found its way to India. What I meant was that it found its way to India too. Well, that was one correction to what I said. And I must sign off right now and uh, hope that you would be willing to join me in part four which will have more to do with what I said just now about Fed's infusion of money. Basically, we'll talk about money, the primary innovation of humankind. See you then. Until then, goodbye.